Hello, today we'll discuss DANE, which is our tool on data automation and network emulation. My name is Saul Althaker, and I'm joined here by my teammates. I'm Parker Addison. Hi, I'm Daniel Yassin. So before we get into the presentation, I want to go over a quick overview. We'll start by talking about the background on traffic classification, then discuss our motivation, then give an introduction to our tool, methodology, and have time for a demo. We'll conclude on our analysis and final thoughts. Computer, computers communicate with servers via packets. This communication with these servers is what we define as network traffic. This communication with the servers also produce traffic flows, which contain things like IP source, IP target, protocol, data, and timestamp. We're also able to look at these communications and analyze them to figure out what type of behavior the user is doing. For example, if that user is streaming a video or browsing the, browsing the web. This network data is also especially helpful to ISPs or internet service providers. ISPs use traffic classification to improve their quality of service. With this new age, people have started to use VPNs a lot more. They do this to improve the security and have remote access to things like to, to, to things like the work. These VPNs also make it very challenging for ISPs. These VPNs obscure the target IPs and encrypt the data. This makes it very hard for the ISPs to classify what the user is doing. So for this project, we have teamed up with Viasat to explore encrypted traffic classification. Viasat is very curious about detecting browsing versus streaming to improve customer experience. Prior to this project, they've teamed with UC San Diego to build an encrypted traffic classifier. This traffic classifier looks at the data set and predicts whether that user is streaming or browsing. And this, this, um, this data, the data set for this classifier that was, it was trained on was collected by UCSD researchers using VPNs. So there's actually many problems with the data collection process that Viasat had in prior to this project, also problems with data collection in the industry itself. So a common approach that, uh, that, we was, that Viasat used prior to our project, and also a common approach for, uh, in the industry, is to generate data from a lab or part of campus. This is very good because all that data generated does use the same internet connection, and oftentimes is using great internet connection. But there's a big issue with it because we can't, we can't assume that all users and all customers have that great internet connection. In the real world, real, and real customers and real users have a varying network condition. But there's also issues with collecting manually. So this means that when, when, uh, when these researchers prior to this project collected the data set, they had to do it manually. So they couldn't do anything else on their computer besides stream that video or browse web. And this also makes it difficult because there's lots of noise from background services that the researchers couldn't control. So this leads us to the question, is there a better way to generate traffic data sets with representative network conditions? Through our research, we found that yes, there is a better way. And through the use, and that's why we, that's what that's what led us to the creation of our tool Dane. Through Dane, we were able to answer the bigger question. Can classifiers trained on unrepresentative data still perform well when exposed to diverse network conditions? So before we dive into the analysis that we got that we got from our Dane tool, we'll go into the Dane tool itself. So the core objectives of our Dane tool is to em emulate network conditions, automate the data, data collection process. We want to make sure this Dane is parallelized and configurable, and we also want to make sure Dane is containerized and system agnostic. And the ways we'll achieve this is by one creating a strong network architecture. And to automate that data collection process, we'll use tools like Damien and also have behavioral or daemon and also use behavioral scripts and collection scripts. We'll also have a configuration pipeline to make sure it's parallelized. And we'll make sure this all this Dane is used using Docker so that is so Dane is containerized and system agnostic. Thank you, Sahil. So when it comes to emulating network conditions, we have a few main objectives. We need to be able to emulate latency, which is the delay that it takes for a packet to reach you. We need to be able to emulate bandwidth, which is kind of the maximum rate at which data can be received. Those two features are very, very important when it comes to network conditions. Uh, finally, we need it to be accurate. So if you ask for 50 uh, milliseconds of latency, it gives you that. And we need it to look realistic. So we're trying to you know, build a data set that looks like human generated data. So it needs our tool needs to look realistic. We accomplish all of this by having a very robust network set up. And what we've essentially done is recreated a real world home network setup using Docker containers. So we have these client containers, which kind of act like you running something on your computer, but these containers can only access the internet through another router container. This gives us a really fine control over the conditions of that internal home network, right? So we can use the router to 
add latency between its connection to the outside internet. And we can use that router to limit the rate at which data can be sent to the inside network. This setup is actually really cool because it's completely isolated from the host and it allows you to run multiple different network conditions side by side within a single computer. It also accomplishes something that isn't traditionally possible within Docker on Windows and Mac. And because we're using this tool called traffic control, there's actually a whole lot more conditions besides latency and bandwidth that we can emulate. When it comes to automating the collection process, we want to avoid as much manual action as possible. We also want this to be reproducible. So if you see a report that's been published that says, hey, we use this tool to generate 10 hours of data doing this specific streaming behavior in these specific network conditions with a VPN on, you should be able to recreate a data set that looks very similar to that. Finally, it needs to be modifiable to fit whatever particular research need you're using this tool for. All of that is done by leveraging three main services, two of which you've seen before. The router, all it cares about is network conditions. The client, that's pretty exciting. The client acts like an end user. It acts like a person running a computer and doing web browsing stuff on their computer. So this has a whole bunch of software on it. It has the web browser. It establishes a connection to the VPN. It runs any behavior scripts to browse the web. Uh, it also collects the actual data. The daemon container or service, we don't need to talk about that much. It just really helps with the automation part because it, it essentially manages all of the other containers and tells them when to run their commands, when to be set up, and when to be torn down. Like I mentioned, the client is probably the most interesting and, and modifiable part of this project because this client is basically a programmatically defined you know, human inside of here that does whatever behavior you want it to do. So you have fine control over what software dependencies are installed in this container, what background services are running. You know, Is it doing email updates in the background? Uh, also, what behavior scripts are being run? And really, you have this, again, programmatically defined human that you have very fine control over. When it comes to being parallelized, we want you to be able to run as many different behaviors and network conditions as, as you can, um, or as you want, right? But keep it simple. So here you get to see kind of the entire pipeline of how, how this tool works. And it may look complicated, but the only part that you need to touch is that config file and the single command of make start. So this, when you write your config file, you define the conditions that you want, the behaviors that you want, whether you want a VPN connection, so on. And then all you need to do is type make run or make start, and everything else will be done for you. Finally, we've accomplished everything we set out to do when it comes to being containerized. So Docker is the only core dependency. It's isolated from your host, so your network conditions aren't affected. You can, if you have a really beefy computer, you can scale up by running a lot of different network conditions and a lot of different clients on the same computer, so you can scale up. If you have multiple computers, you can run Dane on each of them so you can scale out. And we do support all of the major operating systems. There are a couple caveats, especially when it comes to Windows. So Windows Home doesn't support Hyper-V, which we require. And WSL2, which is the new uh, Docker backend that's being used, doesn't support network emulation, which we require. So make sure that you're using Windows uh, Pro or Education or Enterprise. Uh, when it comes to using a VPN, if you ask for 50 milliseconds, our tool will give it to you, but the VPN connection will you know, inject its own a little bit of latency. So you might get 10 or so more milliseconds of latency than you asked for if you use a VPN. Um, but you can adjust for that in the config, right? Uh, we mentioned there's a high memory overhead, so you could theoretically run as many different clients and networks as you want, but it's going to take up a lot of RAM. And then the most important kind of limitation that we want to, to explain is that if your goal is to generate human believable data, data, data that looks like it came from an actual human, uh, that's challenging because not because of anything that the tool is doing, but because it relies on running a piece of code that emulates human behavior. So we tried that with collecting browsing data, but writing a script that browses the web like a human is difficult. So the limitation lies with your scripting ability there. Let's go ahead and jump into a demonstration. If you're following along on a video, you can you know, use these instructions here. Otherwise, we're here in person-ish, so let's try it live. 
the first step is pretty easy. You just need to download the tool. And this is right now downloading any software which rewrote, as well as any dependencies that the tool relies on. That's pretty quick. Once it's done, we can open up the text editor and start messing with the configuration file. So for the purpose of this demo, let's go ahead and run just one behavior, which is a streaming script that we provide as a starter script. And let's do just one network condition, maybe like an, an average network condition of perhaps 70 milliseconds of latency and 20 megabits of download speed. We will use a VPN. Let's connect to the UCSD VPN here, and we don't need to touch anything else. Jumping back into our tool, the only command that we need to run is make, and pretty soon we'll be greeted by the tool. And it says, hey, we weren't following the quick start, right? So we're actually missing an environment file which stores you know, passwords and whatnot. It says, no worries, we created it for you. But since we're using a VPN, that environment file needs to have our login credentials. So it wants us to add our, our username and password in here. Uh, because this is a live demo, I don't want to show you my username and password, so I'm going to copy it from an existing file. Once we've done that, we just press Enter, and the tool, the tool starts getting to work. So the first step is to create all of the routers and emulate the network conditions. That happens pretty quickly. Once it does that, it connects a client to that router and starts trying to set up that client. Right now, we're saying, OK, we connected to the router, and it's waiting to connect to a VPN. So I'm using two-factor authentication on my VPN account. So it's actually sent me an authentication request on my phone, which I'll accept just now. And it should connect within a few seconds. There we go. Once it does so, it starts to run a speed test. And that's to do two things. One, to provide an accurate label for the data. So if we ask for 70, but we're using a VPN, so it might give us 80 or 90, it'll tell us, OK, this data was actually collected with you know, 90 milliseconds of, of latency. Uh, additionally, if we ask for zero milliseconds latency and you know 900 megabits per second, that's more than my home network can achieve. So it will fall back to whatever is actually achievable. There we go. It's done with the speed test. It's now running the streaming script that we wrote that'll just watch YouTube endlessly. And it's using a, a collection tool, data collection tool, to actually collect data on that network traffic. And it says, hey, it's actually achieved 84 milliseconds of latency and 18 megabits of streaming. Once again, the latency is a little bit higher and bandwidth a little bit lower because we're using that VPN connection. If we jump into the data folder, which is created for us, this is the data file. It's actively collecting data and writing to this file. And here's you know, the, the output that we can then do our analysis on. So when it comes to use cases, there's a handful of different things that you can use this tool for, right? And we've summarized it into two main branches. One is network research, which is what we're doing. So you can research traffic classification, right? And you and we'll dive into that in just a little bit. And you can very easily use this to generate data sets, right? For whatever particular area in network research that you want to do. Uh, the other kind of branch would be user uh, experience testing and product testing. So you can have some web application and run it inside of these uh, clients and see how it performs in the different network conditions. Um, thank you, Parker, for showing us how the Dane tool works. And now I'm going to show you guys how we use the Dane tool for our own analysis. Earlier in the, in the presentation, Sahil asked us the question, can classifiers trained on unrepresentative data still perform well when exposed to diverse network conditions? So in order to answer this question, first we needed to come up with the basis for what was poor, average, and good network conditions. So we came up with these parameters, and based on these, we did we set up the parameters in our tool and we got the data in these different network conditions. And initially, we used a browsing script to gather our data. When we gathered our data, we realized that the browsing doesn't really require a good internet connection, so it didn't really change through any of the uh, different network conditions. The poor network condition average and good network conditions gave us the similar results, and because of that, we couldn't really do any analysis for it. So instead of focusing on browsing, we decided to focus on streaming because steaming requires um, good internet connection. And because of that, we were actually able to see some differences among the different network conditions. So whenever there's a huge dip in the 
in the in the bar graphs. That means that our tools stop gathering data. And we call this a buffering event. And we notice after the buffering event that um, after the buffering event is over, the video player tries to load in as much possible in the smallest amount of time possible. So for um, the good network conditions, you can see that it immediately downloaded the uh, around 40 to 50 megabytes a second after megabits per second, right after the buffering event and like into a one to two second period. But at the average and poor network conditions couldn't achieve these high download speeds. So they had to have this high download, but, um, but spread out to a greater period of time. So th these are the fundamental differences between the poor, average, and good network conditions. So once that we once we saw that the, there were differences between the network conditions and the data that we gathered, we wanted to see if this impacted our classifier. And to do this, we used our classifier that we made earlier for Wirestat, which classifies whether a person is browsing or streaming on on their device. So um, we we made this classifier and we trained it on the un, unspecified data gathered from them uh, initially. So this is the data that I didn't take into account diverse network conditions. We trained it on that and then we made predictions um, with the classifier and to check the accuracy of the classifier, we used something called FNR, false negative rate. And we did this 500 times for each um, network condition. And we realized that the FNR for each of the network conditions is relatively the same, meaning our classifier is robust to diverse network conditions. Now that we know this, we want to understand why, why is this is happening. So we look at the features that we used in the classifier. So we divided up the features into two different groups, packet sizes and packet direction ratios, which look at upload and download of the packets. And when we looked at the data from the different um, network conditions, if you look at the top two graphs, those are focused on packet size and they're very same, they're similar. So we realized that packet size is not um, impacted by the diverse network conditions. And if you look at the direction ratio um, graphs that we made, we realized that the total bytes is also very robust, but the packet counts is somewhat flat among the different uh, network conditions for direction ratio. But overall, most of the features seem to be um, robust to the diverse network conditions. So to wrap up what I took away or what we took away from the, our analysis is that the streaming classifier performed similarly in different network conditions. The important features used for streaming classification are robust to changes in network conditions. And this shows that we can accurately, still accurately determine whether a user is streaming or browsing, even if they have poor network conditions. Thank you, Daniel. So there's still a few more directions that we can bring this tool in. The tool continues to be developed and it can support different uh, traffic collection tools, such as using full packet captures with a tool like T-Shark. It can support different behavior scripts, whether you code it yourself or we continue to flesh out the amount of starter scripts that are provided with the tool. Um, and we can even look into even more parallelizability by trying to deploy this on a Kubernetes cluster. Now, the data sets that are generated from this tool can enable a huge amount of greater analysis in this field. So we can determine, for instance, what other features are robust in network conditions. We've already shown that packet size and any feature based on packet size is robust, but what else out there is waiting to be discovered? So this is a list of the references that we use for our project. Our um, analysis report that we that's on the data that we collected from our Dane tool is also listed here. So thank you everyone for listening. If you want, feel free to check out our tool in that link below. Our analysis report is also linked in that in that website URL. Thank you.